Right. Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. As Vedant introduced, this is going to be the concluding session for NDTV's inaugural Defence Summit. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for staying with us. And in this session, we are raising the very moot question, uh, which is coming at the end, but important nonetheless, that how do we build towards a world-class indigenous defence industry? Uh, so, as we said, in as much as India seeks new partnerships to build on the theme of Atmanir Bharta, legacy private organizations have always existed in our country, but have perhaps never been seen to be what they are, world class. At the same time, a host of new companies offer exciting opportunities to meet India's defense requirements. Joining us to discuss further in this panel is Mr. Neeraj Gupta, Managing Director of MKU Group, uh, which uh, provides uh, body armor to some of the leading forces around the world. Captain Nikunj Parashar, founder of Sagar Defense Engineering, uh, which has also in fact been uh, recognized as, uh, for its innovation. It's winner of the Innovation for Defense Excellence. And also, uh, I'm joined by Mr. Ashish Saraf, who is the Vice President and Country Director of India, Thales. Of course, uh, Thales has been in India partnering with the defense sector for seven decades and is a global tech company. So um, he will also be part of this discussion. So taking the question first to uh, Mr. Neeraj Gupta. Um, now, MKU is really known for making top-notch uh, body armor and even high-tech helmets. How has Make in India helped to raise the bar and produce high-quality safety gear, not just for Indian forces, but also for the world, in a way? Uh, thank you. Interesting question. I would first say that um, MKU has been uh, in the business of producing body armor since 2003. And... Um, we brought the technology or started manufacturing composite body armor since 2000 and probably the first company outside of uh, Europe and US to start producing lightweight composite body armor when the India need, felt the need after Kargil war when India was using uh, steel plate body armor. So there was a time when India felt the need that India should be having composite body armor. That's the time when we brought the technology into India. Uh, so MKU has always been looking at the uh, new and new ways of uh, getting into the right stuff, empowering our uh, soldiers with new and new technologies. So we started that uh, and also started exporting in 2003. And today I would say that we have exported to almost like 100 countries, 230 forces uh, have been equipped by our equipments. Uh, we have equipped uh, more than 3 million soldiers, 3,000 platforms. So what is all this means? Uh, MKU has been producing in India for the world since 2003. Our first customer was the Spanish Army way back in 2003. So with the diversity of the customers right from Japan to all the way to Brazil and to Chile and to all the Western country, including India, uh, it gives a challenge for us to make new and new products developing all the time. We invest almost 5% of our revenue in R&D. Uh, today, we have about 40, 45 engineers working on different materials all the time. So I think that's the whole thing. And going forward today, we uh, have developed various range of electro-optics for soldier systems, now also getting into platform optronics as well. Thank right, you. but how, if you are taking specifics, let's say, of India, how does that cater to the world? If you can el elaborate on that further. So I, I think uh, very early on, we just realized that, yes, India is a growing market, but the requirements are finite. So we started to look at the international market. As I said, our first exports was in 2003 when nobody in India from knew even how to export to other countries. So I think that was a conscious call that we took as a country company. And one thing that also we take a pride that whether it's uh, armor or electro optics, all the products that we manufacture, uh, in India or um, UAE or in Germany, all the IP belongs to us so that we are free to export wherever is required. And we have a great team to develop these products. Right. Uh, coming to you, uh, Captain Parashar. Now, Sagar Engineering, uh, if I can ask that question, naval warfare has uh, forever been changed over the last two years. If you just look at the last two, three, four years of conflicts that we have seen, uh, especially as Vishnu was also referring to in a previous session that in Ukraine, which is a country without Navy, uh, it has sunk numerous frontline Russian warships by the usage 
smart in usage of drones. Uh, now, is that the future of naval warfare that we are working towards and that India needs to invest in? Uh, first of all, thank you so much, Ms. Biswas and NDTV for hosting me here. Uh, question is absolutely perfect and, and this is something uh, the Navy itself and the government at MOD level is working on. Uh, primarily, we were winner of one of the IDEX challenges where we started off, which was on unmanned surface vehicle. Uh, Samir in the last panel was also talking about decentralized unmanned surface vehicle swarms. This is exactly what is now being currently built here in India. And, and when you look at across globally where the conflicts is changing in, you have the anti-drone systems coming in, you have drones as a primary threat to your bigger capital ships and destroyer, which you can see here in the Ukraine war, one after the other uh, kamikaze vessels are going in and getting in right into that spot. This is where uh, our current government and the Navy is already looking at that front. And there are certain niche technologies at classified level we are working in with the Navy. Certain trials have been already completed. And matter of fact, I proudly say that now we are getting into induction phase. So there are massive contracts being signed across in that regard. And by in coming two years, you'd be seeing countries for first swarm of unmanned surface vehicle being launched uh, here in India and on the coast. That's right. In fact, uh, recently, I think 12 of them were procured by the Navy, uh, which uh, your company was involved in innovating and making. Uh, that is correct. Uh, we are building these right now out of our Pune Chakram facility. Uh, these are again swarm of 12 vessels uh, which will be working along the coast in parallel to the capital ships in across having extended ranges of 400 nautical miles. So this has been, you know, and I would say this, this is possible something and I'll come back to a speech of a small quote of Honorable Prime Minister which he did during his maiden 14th, uh, you know, on, on 2014 on his maiden independence speech. He said that Let's come here, make in India, manufacture in India, because we believe that we have the talent, we have the design capability, and we have a desire and dream to do it. I think since then, uh, I know as an entrepreneur also, I started thinking, and, and that led to the formation of Sagar Defense Engineering, quitting a job coming here in India, and I actually started working on. And a technology of this complex nature where you need massive investments, this would have not been possible if the government support would have not been there. So this realization has come through due to massive support of IDEX and the Indian Navy and at the MOD level. And that has led to actual induction of these uh, platforms. Right. We'll come back to the investment and funding point later in the discussion. But uh, going across to you, Mr. Saraf, now from the Mirage 2000 to the Rafal, uh, how has Thales been a partner in India? If you can just uh, describe your seven decade journey in the country. And what okay. can we look forward to? Thank you. So, uh, thank you for inviting Thales to this forum. Um, for Thales, we completed seven decades uh, in India last year. So, it was our 70th anniversary and uh, the legacy goes like we were instrumental in creation of Bharat Electronics. So, that's the, the, the legacy and the heritage that we carry uh, in the country in terms of Atmanirbhar. Now, through this Obviously, we were making in India long before make in India actually became uh, a big narrative. Uh, but as far as our footprint and the make in India is concerned, uh, we are present across seven cities. But the, the key here is, is that we engineer in India, design in India, and manufacturing uh, manufacture in India. So, uh, you know, we've, we've been doing and graduating from just engineering to, to design and then making it and export and so on. Um, our joint ventures and, uh, and obviously a, a complex web of supply chain partners and processes, it not only does manufacture things like the ASA radar for Rafal, the electronic warfare suite um, for Rafal Spectra, and this started with the with making it for the Indian Air Force, but then we graduated it to making it for the world now. So proudly, you know, uh, some of the the cutting edge technology that goes on to the Rafale, it is actually made here and exported, and that gets delivered to to our customers worldwide. We also started doing research in India, so we are one of the major global for conglomerates that actually moved in to do research in India. Thales, as, as you, some of you may know, we pioneer open hardware research and, and a lot of that happens right here in our uh, research facility, research and technology facility in Bangalore. 
besides that, I mean, obviously, we have, we have developed, a, you know, supply chain partnerships of over 77 different companies. One of our esteemed partners is, is right here on stage who develop uh, Optronics for us and, and Elfie, that's the name of the product uh, that uh, we are, you know, looking and making it for worldwide use. So we've already demonstrated that it's not only just India for India, but India for the world. Uh, having ex and, and, and our exports are touching over 2,000 crore per year um, and, and growing in double-digit percentage points. So uh, we have a significant presence and, and going forward the plan, in fact, extends to, to expanding this footprint a lot more beyond what we have currently. Right. Um, Mr. Gupta, coming back to you, like, you know, this is a question that we touched upon earlier, but uh, if we just look at the last four years and the kind of wars, conflicts that we have in fact seen. Um, you know, as he said, that emerging technology and uh, innovating constantly, something that every firm has to keep up with, especially in the defense sector, what we have been seeing over the past few years. What lessons has MQ drawn from it? And uh, how are we adapting technology, if you talk about your firm with, in these changing times? Okay. So, as we all saw that, um, Russia-Ukraine conflict, use of drones and firepower was very much prevalent. Uh, during this um, Israel-Hamas conflict, use of anti-drone was very much of the need. So things like those are there. And MKU is also now today at the forefront of development of the electro-optics technology. Uh, right now, very recently, we have developed uh, something, uh, uh, sites for grenade launchers and heavy machine guns which normally traditionally iron sights are being used and the purpose that has to be done by grenade launchers is not being served without these kind of sights. And with these kind of sights, uh, the targets or the mission can be accomplished very, uh, very nicely. Uh, another thing that India has, uh, sorry, my company has developed is uh, um, first of its kind, a rifle protection helmet. So traditionally the helmets are only for against handgun ammunition. Uh, we launched it globally during Millipole in Paris last year, and that is getting a lot of traction, not only in India, but also uh, in uh, Western world, in Europe, and in the US. So, so we work on the, I would say, cutting-edge technologies on the sectors that we are. Um, however, st still I would say that um, one thing that I would like to mention here is that, yes, Indian requirements are becoming so advanced and mature, they, they are also pushing the limits of the technology and that is also helping the Indian companies and startups to develop new and new technologies. Right, if you can elaborate on the, it's a Corva Doma uh, helmet, right? If you can yeah. just elaborate on how it's unique because I was discussing earlier today yes. also with your colleague. It's a Cabro Doma 360, why uh, 360? Because it gives uh, all around protection uh, on five different zones that are critical for a soldier and it's lightweight and uh, the back phase deformation is quite low. So because of this, it makes it very unique in the world and it's first of its kind helmet in the world today. Right, and you've got clients, international clients already. Uh... We, we are getting a lot of requests for such a helmet and we are shipping all the samples to all over the world, of course, uh, first to the Indian Army. Right, okay, great. Uh, coming back to you, Captain Parashar, uh, you know, again, touching upon the point that drones on the battlefields in Ukraine have in fact, represented how, you know, just by using a drone, they have been able to sink warships, uh, which was absolutely unthinkable uh, earlier. Now, how is it that a drone which is costing just a few dollars and is knocking out tanks which are much, much more valuable, have, uh, you know, been made with cutting-edge technology? Now, is legacy weapon system being replaced, with being almost rendered obsolete by these methods? Well, I would not say that the legacy weapon systems are being absolutely rendered useless by these systems. It's, it's the way the warfare is, dynamics are changing in today's time. Now, uh, when we are looking at the warfare dynamics, and especially in these kind of asymmetric warfare, uh, conventional warfare was completely different, where you had your tanks, you had your infantries going into the battle tanks, and you had the opposite way they were coming across to you. But where the warfare dynamics have changed uh, today in these smart objects, which may cost few thousands of dollars, and you have a million dollar tank therein, 
they are able to cover those areas at much more shorter distances without uh, the person actually being there on the battlefield. So the person who is actually operating these platforms are sitting quite far away at a distance. So he's away from the harm's way. He's ready to take all the risk with the platform. So what happens at the end, the only thing what you're going to lose is just a drone, right? So the risk appetite is much more higher on the battlefield with these platforms compared to the tanks. So then a tank, which is, which is a conventional warfare, becomes a sitting duck in front of these small cutting edge technologies to come in. At the same time where you have AI uh, technology pushing into the boundaries of limits of war simulations coming in, uh, the systems are starting to think on their own. So that means where a human's, uh, you know, ability of a human to look uh, across in a warfare domain scenario on a tactical system, the domain awareness is also increasing in. So his reach of combat, combat management is getting much more higher compared to a conventional system. So that is exactly happening herein. So as you see the warfare coming in uh, across, the anti-systems also will have to come into play in these uh, tank systems coming in. And uh, this is a discussion happening in the army right now. So and if you see, there is an EOI which has come from an army where tanks now they want fitted with drones across. So that means tank can actually look something four and a five kilometers ahead across and then counter these technologies which are there. So it's a thought process, it's a dynamics of how the war is happening and changing. And with time, it's going to be adapt. Uh, it's going to be get adapted in the combat system. Right. So in terms of innovation, where do you think the focus needs to be when it needs to, when we need to counter such methods which are being used, which we have seen being successfully used by Ukraine? So where does the thrust of innovation need to be? So the thrust of innovation, and, and if you look at the government policy also, which is there uh, right now, they're looking at two, uh, two places. One is 70% uh, into the AI that is non-kinematic, and 30% is into kinematic end. On the non-kinematic end is they're looking at combat management systems and battle management awareness systems where they are putting a lot of impetus. In terms of kinetic where the impetus is where your capex is also required and we recently saw the Aditi scheme for deep tech and all that is being launched across by the government. Uh, they're looking at these drone solutions which can be loaded on these infantries and on warships which can actually not make them look like a sitting duck and can act as an anti-drone system or a combat which can help them to get them combat ready with the new age technology advances which are happening in the uh, battle management scenarios. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mr. Saraf, if I can come back to you again. Now, what is Thales? Because the larger overview of our session today is about Atmanir Bharta. You know, how can we build a world-class indigenous defense industry right here? So what is Thales doing to support that? Um, well, the short answer is bringing a lot of technology. But uh, so, you know, besides, uh, obviously, Thales is, is part of pretty much, uh, Thales is a tech company, and, and we go on every large platform that you can imagine, for example, you know, warships to submarines to aircrafts and so on. And you already mentioned uh, Mirage to Rafale on the air side, our journey. But the key is, when the platforms operate, you know, the systems and the subsystems and the technology that goes onto the platform, you know, that's key. And that's exactly what we bring, you know. The, I will give you an example, the radar that operates on the Rafale. It's one of the, the most cutting edge radars that, you know, one can see across the world. Or the electronic warfare suite, the communication systems that go into the airplane that you know, air to air, ground to air, and so on. Uh, similarly, from a technology perspective, we are also looking to, to bring in the uh, short range air defense systems uh, as part of our partnership. Uh, rockets, guided and unguided, that we are looking in to bring as part of a partnership that we, we, are, already, we are already looking to forge. Uh, plus, on optronics, we already have technology that we co-developed with MKU. Um, our joint ventures manufacture uh, and now will actually have backward integrate into engineering, etc. The technologies that go into Rafale as well as on, on the submarines, uh, various submarines, and a specific example would be sonar. So there are many such technologies. Not only that, we, we have started to develop avionics at our engineering center human machine interface specifically pertaining to avionics. So these are some of the technologies that either we've already brought in or are in the process of, of establishing some sort of footprint in country to, to design and manufacture. Uh, going forward, we, exp we, we would expand on this 
and uh, we have a line of, uh, of technology related line items that are uh, poised to come into India. This plus on the, on the, the innovation side, cybersecurity is one of the key areas that we work on uh, that we do right here in India, a majority of it, cloud protection because the new age warfare, it's, it's also a lot of it is cyber and protection of critical assets today, you know, be it critical assets related to power uh, plants, airports, or it could be satellite communication. All of them are, are vulnerable to cyber attacks and that's exactly what we do. We protect all these assets uh, from cyber, uh, you know, from a cyber standpoint to make sure that their vulnerability is reduced and, and the, the reliance on those uh, that our forces and our systems have increases. So Thales has a, has a, has a long list of technologies that we already have and, and are, are ready to bring in or a pos position to bring in by nearly doubling our footprint in the coming three to five years. Right. In fact, uh, interesting that you touch upon that point, of course, because my next question to both of you for that matter is connected to that. Now, what seems to be a bigger hurdle? Uh, is it for, for private firms, private defense firms in the country? Is it uh, funding or sharing of core technology? Is that a challenge or if at all, which one is the bigger one? First uh, to you, Mr. Gupta. If you are, my, my view would be more or less it's both. Uh, I would say funding is only for, I would say more for startups and for MSMEs. But also, what I also feel is that um, India needs to invest more in core critical technologies of raw materials, composite materials and stuff like that. And when it comes to making those projects viable, uh, I don't think so it is viable without any government support. So funding of those kind of projects and technologies, government has to step in, then only we can do that. And today's geopolitical situation is that, God forbid if there is some full-scale war, the, the countries do take sides, and then although we are developing a lot of uh, in-house technologies for manufacturing of equipment, but what will happen in case the source of raw material is not available in India. Mm. So that is something I, I, I personally feel worried about. That's uh, one thing. And um, you touched upon the technology, uh, transfer of technologies, right? Um, my, my personal feeling is that India will have to work on development of its own technologies, although we have um, examples like Thales and many others. But still, there are many technologies that only have, India will only will have to work upon to develop uh, on its own for its own Atmanirbha Bharat and being self-reliant. Having the surprise element as well. Yeah. <laughs> Captain Parashar? Uh, two things, I'm a startup. So yeah. uh, yes, uh, funding certainly comes in uh, because the moment uh, you go across to the venture capitalist and the ESG laws comes into play, and then that's very difficult, for, especially for foreign funds to come in. Though government has, through the FDI limit, they have gone up to 75%, and under government rule, you can go up to 100% FDI. Uh, parallelly, along with the funding, then comes the technology part. It is not technology in the sense what we are developing, but technology in the sense of semiconductors, uh, technology in the sense of having an ecosystem where, where you're designing a 16-layer PCB or a 64-layer PCB, and you could manufacture here in India itself. So that ecosystem is still not there. So to have a uh, you know, absolute Atma Nirbhar Bharat in terms of self-reliance in defense ecosystem, our dependency has to be on our ecosystem. And, and the way the Silicon Fab Labs, where we are looking at, which is going to be set up in coming years and give us another five years down the line, that's where the real progress would start across. And, and, and from, you know, where we have categories of IDDA, Make in India, Buy in India, Buy Global, and then, you know, it's complete global coming in you would really see the IDDM really kicking up. That is the time where uh, your defense companies and, and startups will really show you the promising colors. So right now, the support which is there from the government through the different government routes and funding scheme is perfect. Uh, more and more uh, as the, you know, the investment size could go up, especially on the grant side, that could be much more better. And if that goes through five years down the line, I think we see a very bright future coming in. And if that, that support is important, and then this is going to give the thrust to the VCs and other investors also that the government is very serious about it. Right. Um, uh, coming back to that point uh, we were making earlier in terms of, you know, innovation and as you were mentioning about developing technology which is for India, made in India. Now, 
Uh, what we have seen so far as far as drones, and we are coming back to you for drones because uh, you know you specialize in that, but uh, mostly what we have seen is that most drone systems which are incorporated are in a loop. But has machine learning or AI in any way changed that or evolved to a point where drones can be deployed to, deployed to attack targets of opportunity uh, based on choices that they can make? Uh, absolutely. Uh, Samir is doing that already in terms of aviation platforms. Uh, we are doing this in terms of uh, maritime platforms when we talk about maritime drones. I, I feel personally very proud to put across that, you know, the Gulf of Aden where all the piracy attacks are happening in right now. And we have our warships, we have drones which are built here completely out of India are landing and taking off from our warships while they're on the move. So these technologies are there. Uh, there are startups here in country, um, I would like to name them, called M. Rafay, out of Greater Noida. They are building these uh, drones which actually are in a kamikaze mode and they attack, they go and drops. So this is there. Now the most important part and the ethical dilemma comes in is, is the drone going to do it on its own? Or is the human in the loop which is going to uh, do across? So this is a question which needs to be solved and it is going to evolve over the period of time and how the conflict scenario changes. But yes, the technology is already there and systems are in. Uh, our USVs carry a 12.7 mm gun uh, with a short portable missiles also. So this is there in India and you're going to see them in action very soon. Right, good to know. In fact, a lot of people would probably uh, come to know from uh, what you just said. But uh, coming to you, Mr. Saraf, now, how is, uh, and this question is specific to you and unique to you because uh, underlining Thales' presence in India is also the fact that there's a strong Indo-French strategic equation. Uh, one of the most important that France has with any country. Now, how does that tie in with the work that Thales is doing in the defense sector in the country? Yeah, you, you know, it's a, it's a perfect point you brought in and, and a, a great follow-up to the previous one, what's important funding or core technology, right? So this touches the core technology topic. Uh, the relationship between India and France is at its best right now. I mean, it was evident by the fact that uh, Honorable Prime Minister Modi was invited to the French Bastille Day celebrations as a chief guest, and uh, President Macron was a chief guest at our uh, Republic Day celebrations. Um, what has happened is that the two countries have, have created such conducive environment in defense uh, in terms of exchange of defense collaboration, and that includes technology uh, you know, as, a, as a core or a prime component, that it allows companies like us to you know, actually come in, establish, uh, and transfer, and develop the technology here you know, further because the support is there. As you know, defense is a very regulated sector. Every time you, you transact uh, across uh, borders, uh, there has to be export licensing and the government approvals uh, and, and so on and so forth. And same is true for import when we import something. But for us, it's been um, you know, an absolute pleasure to kind of work in this environment where the two countries are so aligned geopolitically that it only enhances the collaboration that we do with our Indian partners. And you know, that includes transfer of technology, investments in the defense segment, and then taking the technology here, absorbing, helping our partners absorb it, and developing that further to create new variations of this technology for the future that we can use not only for Indian market to supply to the forces, but also to export globally. So uh, it, it's, been, it, it's been an incredible, uh, way to, to exchange and, and develop this segment across both countries. I mean, it's not only just one way where things are coming in, but th there's not been a better time for an Indian defense firm to go do business in France as well, because mm -hmm. that kind of collaboration is also being promoted and fostered uh, by the governments. Right. And if we talk about success stories, uh, Mr. Gupta, I would like to touch upon the fact that MKU is one of the biggest Indian defense exporters. So what is the key ingredient in terms of uh, MKU success story as far as exports are concerned? I would say persuasion and persu persuasion <laughs> and perseverance. Right, so but... Continued huh. focus on exports way back in 2003, I would say. Uh, 
we invested a lot in building the brand. India, until I would say, until very recent, we, nobody even thought of India exporting defense goods. And we had to face a lot of challenges. Um, in order to overcome those, we even acquired a company in Germany. That was a big boost to our brand. So things like those, uh, we exhibited in a military exhibitions with a lot of good uh, collaterals, etc. We put a brand, we put a lot of effort in our marketing. Uh, I, I think those things and constantly pursuing on those opportunities was, was something that brought us uh, the success here. Yeah. Right. Um, I'm, uh, unfortunately, we'll have to close the session here. I'm being told we're completely out of time. But thank you to all of you for being part of this panel discussion and sharing your insights. Thank you so much. And uh, let me hand back to Vedant, Vishnu. <laughs> Vishnu, all right. <laughs> oh, okay.